Well, good Welcome evening, church. church. Welcome to our Maundy Thursday service. Good to see all of you tonight. Uh, before we get started, this is a service of communion, so uh, if you're watching at home, you'll want to get your, your elements ready for communion later on in the service. If you're here in the sanctuary, you'll definitely want to get uh, one of the little cups of grape juice with the, with the bread on it um, for communion in a little bit, so... Number of thank yous I want to make tonight, first to Hannah and Andrew and to Dave for uh, their participation and assistance tonight. This is something Andrew and I kind of worked up, so where it goes. Uh, also, thank you to Sarah for, for helping out and getting things set up up front. Um, just a reminder that we do have... Uh, our Stations of the Cross Guided Meditation down in the chapel. It's a series of eight stations. Uh, when you enter the chapel, there's a booklet there that you pick up, and the booklet guides you through uh, the different stations. Each station has a scripture reading, a devotional, uh, an activity, and a prayer. Uh, it's meant to be an opportunity for us to deepen um, our faith and grow in our relationship with Jesus Christ as we walk through uh, the last week of Jesus' life in picture and experience. Um, the Stations of the Cross um, are a devotional practice that, that many think of as Catholic, but it is, um, they are becoming much more and more Protestant uh, in their in their use, um, so we hope you will take time to to experience that um, before the twenty fourth when we take it down. Uh, Easter Sunday or Good Friday and Easter. Good Friday and tomorrow night is at seven here in the sanctuary. Easter Sunday will be nine o'clock here in the sanctuary, and boy, do we have a lot planned for Easter Sunday. So we hope you can join us for that. Well, tonight uh, we gather to celebrate what's called Maundy Thursday. It's, uh, tonight we commemorate that last night, that last supper Jesus shared with his disciples. The, the name for this holy night comes from Latin. It's uh, Mandatum Novum. Uh, it means new commandment. Um, in John chapter 12, verse 24, Jesus offers a new commandment to his followers uh, as he tells them to love one another uh, and then washes their feet and, and instructs them to do the same. Monday Thursday service leads us from the upper room and the Last Supper to the Garden of Gethsemane and Judas' betrayal to the halls of power at Caiaphas's and uh, Pilate's and then on to uh, the crucifixion and Golgotha. And when we meditate on the meaning of Jesus' death on the cross, it's always, um, always helpful to kind of place ourselves maybe into the story as much as we can. And so as we gather at the table tonight, uh, I would invite you to turn your hearts and your minds to an upper room. Uh, as we participate in communion, let your hearts and minds return to that scene. Candles burning brightly, illuminating the faces of those gathered at the table. Jesus is present just as he is here tonight. He commands his disciples to remember. So may we remember as well. To remember is to put back together. And tonight, as we remember the events of that night long ago, let us put the story of God's grace and love back together and discover its meaning for us again today. Spirit of gentleness, blow through the wilderness, calling and free. 
Spirit, spirit of restlessness, stir me from placidness, wind, wind on the sea. up the mountains from the valleys of sleep and over the eons you call to each thing awake from your slumbers and rise on your wings spirit spirit of gentleness blow through Stir me from placidness, wind, wind on the sea. You swept through the desert, you stung with the sand, and you goaded your people with the law and a land. When they were confounded with idols and lies, then you spoke. gentleness blow through the wilderness calling and free spirit spirit of restlessness stir me from placidness with wind on the sea you sang in a stable you cried from a hill then you whispered in silence when the whole world was still. And down in the city you called once again when you blew through your people on the rush of the wind. Spirit, spirit of gentleness, Blow through the wilderness, calling and free. Spirit, spirit of restlessness, stir me from placidness, wind, wind on the sea. You call from tomorrow, you break ancient schemes. From the bondage of sorrow, the captives dream dreams. Our women see visions, our men clear their eyes. With bold new decisions, your people arise. Spirit, spirit of gentleness, Blow through the wilderness, calling and free. Spirit, spirit of restlessness, stir me from placidness, wind, wind on the sea. Shepherd me, O oh God, beyond my wants, beyond my fears, from death into life. God is my shepherd, so nothing shall I want. I rest in the meadows of faithfulness and love. I walk by the quiet waters of peace. 
Shepherd me, O oh God, beyond my wants, beyond my fears, from death into life. Gently you raise me and heal my weary soul. You lead me by pathways of righteousness and truth. My spirit shall sing the music of your name. Shepherd me, O oh Shepherd me beyond, beyond my wants, beyond my fears, from death to will be projected on the screens, I would invite you to join me. We gather at the threshold of a new creation. We gather as the image bearers of God to be one with each other, to be one with creation, to be one with God. We gather where the groaning of our heart finds harmony, where the yokes of bondage are removed where the chains of oppression are broken, where the wounded are made whole, where the ground underfoot becomes holy. We gather to remember the wonders of God, to speak God's name into the darkness, to celebrate God's love. We gather to share the mysteries of ordinary bread and everyday grapes becoming holy, for the word made flesh and the blessing of a new covenant. We gather in a thin place where heaven and earth meet. We gather so faith take hold on the banks of the river of life that flows through the city of God. We gather where dreams of a new Eden grow, sprouting leaves for the healing of the nation. Where we gather, all are welcome, all are loved, all are embraced as they are for who they are. Where we gather, may hearts find a home, may God's love be made real, and may the Spirit be present. Let us pray. Loving God, we give you thanks on this holy night for this meal Jesus shared that is meant to nourish not our physical bodies, but our souls, our spirits, so that we might become more like him. As we remember the events of the upper room on the night of Jesus' betrayal and arrest, open our eyes to the beauty of Jesus' sacrificial love, to his presence with us here tonight. We 
thank you for the gift of this holy meal. This meal Jesus commanded us to share. We thank you for this sign of your love for the world Jesus came to redeem. As we gather at the table, remove everything that separates us from you and from one another. Let us experience your presence as our spirits are nourished by this time together and through this holy meal. In darkness, longing for truth, we turn to you. Make us your own, your holy people, light for the world to see. Christ, be our light, shine in our hearts, shine through the darkness. Christ, be our light, shine in your church, gather today. Longing for peace, our world is troubled. Longing for hope, many despair. Your word alone has power to save us. Make us your living voice. Christ, be our light. Shine in our hearts, shine through the darkness. Christ, be our light shine in your church gathered today longing for food many are hungry longing for water many still thirst make us your bread broken for others shared until all are fed Christ be our light shine in our hearts shine through the darkness Christ be our light shine in your church gathered today longing for shelter many are homeless longing for warmth many are cold make us your building sheltering others walls made of living stone Christ be our light shine in our hearts shine through the darkness Christ be our light shine in your church gather today many the gifts many the people many the hearts that yearn to belong let us be servants to one another making your kingdom come Christ be our light, shine in our hearts, shine through the darkness. Christ be our light, shine in your church, gather today. Tonight's scripture reading is taken from John chapter 13, reading verses 21 to 30. This is John's telling of that night in the upper room. Jesus was troubled in spirit, declared, Very truly, I tell you, one of you will betray me. The disciples looked at one another, uncertain of whom he was speaking. One of his disciples, the one whom Jesus loved, was reclining next to him. Simon Peter therefore motioned to him to ask Jesus, of whom he was speaking. So while reclining next to Jesus, he asked him, Lord, who is it? Jesus answered, It is the one to whom I give this piece of bread when I have dipped it in the dish. And so when he had dipped the piece of bread, he gave it to Judas, son of Simon Iscariot. After he received the piece of bread, Satan entered into him. Jesus said to him, do quickly what you are going to do. Now no one at the table knew why he said this to him. And some thought that because Judas had the common purse, Jesus was telling him, buy what we need for the festival. Or that he should give something to the poor. So after the re receiving the piece of bread, 
immediately went out, and it was night. <clears throat> Let us pray. Loving God, <clears throat> the night closes in. We gather at your table seeking your peace, seeking your presence, seeking communion with you and with one another. This night begins the most difficult time in the church year as we watch you journey to the cross. So we ask that you would bless this time tonight. Give us ears to hear your message and hearts open to your will. In Jesus' name. Well, it's always interesting when the four Gospels converge on a single story. It doesn't happen very often. Matthew, Mark, and Luke, um, they'll do it once in a while, but John, John's kind of the oddball. We're not sure exactly, or I don't think John was sure exactly where he fit in. And so many of the stories in John are not mirrored in the synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. I'm never quite sure when this happens, when all four Gospels come together. I'm never quite sure which one to use. In this case, I decided on the Gospel of John. The reason is simple. John devotes four chapters of his Gospel to the upper room. I counted them up this week. That's 155 verses. Now, there are 879 verses in John. I did not count them up. Google's always right. <laughs> so of, in John's Gospel, of the 879 verses, 155 are devoted to the upper room. That's 17% if my math is correct. 17% of John's Gospel happens in the upper room. One night in Jesus' life was so important to John that he devoted this much of his writing to it. So if the upper room was that important to John, it makes sense for us to spend a little time there as well. The events of this holy week and the upper room are a testimony to the power of love, the power of love to transform human hearts and to change people's lives. Jesus spent his life teaching people the meaning of love. Through word and deed, he showed us how to love God and our neighbors. He healed the sick and fed the hungry. He made the blind see, the lame walk. He invited the outcast and the marginalized, women and children, tax collectors and sinners to come to his table, or he met them at theirs. He broke bread with the least and the lost, and he shared the cup of redemption with each of them. Jesus crossed the boundaries of race, nationality, ethnicity, gender, and class. He challenged the religious authorities, scoffed at those who were self-absorbed and too self-righteous to care for others. He called out hypocrites and admonished the scribes and Pharisees for their hardened hearts. He offered a simple message. Love God, love your neighbor, love yourself. And they crucified him for it. As we gather with Jesus and the disciples in the upper room, we can see the shadow of the cross on the horizon. That shadow is falling over the scene. We can feel the cold, dark night approaching. We know the enemies of God are conspiring. 
plotting to silence this radical, this rebel who claims to be the anointed one, the Messiah. Jesus threatens the comfortable way of life of the religious leaders. He threatens their power. He doesn't care about the status quo. He's willing to turn their world and the whole world upside down. And they will crucify him for it. (coughs) Jesus has gathered in the upper room with his disciples those he calls his brothers, the ones who called him rabbi, teacher, friend. Even as they share this last supper, Jesus knows the disciples will desert him. He knows Judas is going to betray him, that he's already betrayed him as he's conspired with the religious leaders who wanted to get rid of Jesus. Was Judas angry at some slight? Was he disappointed that Jesus wasn't raising an army to overthrow the Romans? Was he angry Jesus allowed a woman to anoint his head with costly perfume because Judas thought there was a better use for that money? In the end, did Jesus fail to meet Judas' expectations? Is that what it was? Is that what caused him to betray his teacher, his friend? We will never know what what Judas was thinking. What was in his heart when he betrayed Jesus. And I guess it really doesn't matter. Here's what does matter to me tonight and hopefully to each of you. It's the fact that even though Jesus knew Judas was going to betray him, he made room for him at the table. He could have had the disciples take Judas out back and get rid of him, but he didn't. Instead, He welcomes Judas to the table. He gives Judas a place at the table. And not just any place. He gave Judas the place of honor. Who's seen uh, a picture or, or in person Da Vinci's Last Supper? Okay. Now you have because Dave's gonna put it up on the screen. Well, it's beautiful, Da Vinci got it totally wrong. He has Jesus sitting in the middle of a long table with the disciples spread out on either side of him. But in Jesus' day, that's not how it was done. Jesus and his disciples would have been reclining on or dining at a U-shaped table. They wouldn't have been sitting in chairs, but on cushions on the floor, leaning on one another, with their feet kicked out behind them, which is how Jesus was able to wash their feet, even though they were sitting at the table. Now, at this table, as the diagram shows, Jesus would have been sitting in the second place. That's where the host sat. To the host's right would have been the second most honored guest. And in this case, uh, John 13, verse 23 tells us it was the disciple Jesus loved. Now, John, the author of the gospel, often refers to himself that way, as the disciple Jesus loved. So we extrapolate that it was probably John sitting to Jesus' right. Simon Peter would have been across the table over on this side at the end, which is why he motioned to John to ask Jesus who it was that was going to betray him. 
And this is where things get interesting, as you can see from the picture. Let's look at John chapter 13, verse 26 for a minute. It says, it is, Jesus is speaking. It says, he says, it is the one to whom I give this piece of bread when I have dipped it in the dish. So when he had dipped the bread, he gave it to Judas, son of Simon Iscariot. Now, if we believe John, and we have no reason not to, this means Judas was directly to the left of Jesus. He was in the third seat. Now, if the second most honored guest is sitting on the host's right, who do you think is sitting on the host's left? the most honored guest at the table. Now think about that for just a minute. Jesus gives Judas, his betrayer, the seat of greatest honor. Even though he knows what Judas is about to do, he breaks bread with him. He even washes Judas' feet. Judas is welcomed and loved. There's a place for him at the table. Church, what does that say about God? What does that say about God? How does that impact our understanding of grace, of who's in and who's out? What does that mean for us? Now, it's tempting at this point uh, for someone to ask, well, where is Judas after betraying Jesus? And I'm not going to get into that conversation. Is Judas in heaven? Is Judas in hell? What's important to me tonight is the fact that Judas had a seat at the table. I take great comfort in that fact. Now, I've often said that if I can walk in the doors of a church without it catching fire, anybody can come to church. If there was room for Judas at the table with Jesus, there's room for you and me, too. There's room for our worst enemy. There's hope for you and me, too. There's hope for our worst enemy, too. And if we're honest, we're not all that different from Judas. Our lives don't always conform to God's will. We stumble and fall. We do things we know we shouldn't do. We don't do things we know we should do. And with every harsh word, with every angry action, When we fail to do justice, love kindness, and walk humbly with God, when we exclude rather than include, when we fail to see or refuse to see the image of God in another human becoming, when we fail to love God, our neighbor, and ourselves, we betray Christ too. And if we're honest, we do that a lot. But the good news of this night, of this holy week, is that human sin doesn't have the last word. God does. And God says, you are mine. God says, you are loved. God says, you are welcome. God says, there's a place for you at the table just as you are for who you are because I made you and I love you no matter what. That's the message I see in Scripture. Doesn't matter if you're a sinner or a saint, rich or poor, gay or straight, black or white, young or old, you are welcome at the Lord's table. 
There's a place for you. And you are home. And I'll have words with anyone who says otherwise. And that's the problem. Because there are people in the world who say otherwise. Maybe not here at FPC, but at school, in businesses, in other churches. Not every place is as open and affirming as we are. Not everyone in our community has heard the message. Not everyone in our community feels welcome in places like this. And it's our job to change that. There are people who are looking for belonging, who are trying to figure out who they are. People who don't feel comfortable in the body they were born with, who battle addiction and mental illness and personal demons. They've been told they don't matter, that they just need to get over it, that they need to conform, that they need to change and fit in. They've been cut off from their families, from their community, from... They just want a place to be loved, to feel safe, to be who they are. Not just to be who they are, but to be who they are as they are. They want to find people who will come alongside them and walk with them through whatever challenges life has, who won't judge them or criticize them or belittle them. I wonder, can we be that place? Can we be those advocates and allies? Can we make room at the table for them? Can we show the world what the beloved community really looks like? I saw this great meme, Dave had it up a few minutes ago, and it's one I think is very, very true. When you learn how to sit at the table with your Judas, you'll understand the love of Christ. When you learn to sit at the table with your Judas, you'll understand the love of Christ. Church, if Judas was welcome at the table, if we're welcome at the table, it's time to show the world that there's a place at the table for everyone. And it's time to invite them to that feast. Amen. Let us pray. Oh, there's a, this story in the Gospels about a woman anointing Jesus with perfumed oil right before his arrest and crucifixion. It was a humble and costly act, an intercession for a man who would soon be laid in a borrowed tomb. Like that woman, we are called to intercede in the lives of the people and world around us. So I would invite you to join me in prayer. Following each petition, we will join in singing Lord, prepare me. Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary, pure and holy, tried and true, with thanksgiving, I'll be a living sanctuary. Merciful God, on this, the night when Jesus was betrayed, your son washed the disciples' feet as an act of love and mercy. Teach us humility in our own lives 
so we can follow his example of love and service. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary, pure and holy, tried and true. Thanksgiving, I'll be a living sanctuary for you. On this night, Jesus prayed that his disciples would be one, united in love and purpose. Lord, we grieve for the division in our nation and world, in our communities and families, even in our own hearts. We pray for the leaders of the world that they would be unified in their vision for the good of all, and anointed with a spirit of justice and light. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary, pure and holy, tried and true, with thanksgiving, I'll be a living sanctuary for you. On this night, Jesus prayed that his disciples would love one another. Lord, our world can be anything but loving sometimes. Our hearts break for those who suffer from persecution and oppression, war and violence, abuse and neglect. We pray for those who are broken, who are rejected, who feel unloved, they may be anointed with a spirit of hope and of peace. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary, pure and holy, tried and true. Thanksgiving, I'll be a living sanctuary for you. On this night, Jesus loved his friends to the very end. Lord, we open our hearts tonight to all who face darkness. We pray for the sick for those who mourn, for those trapped in abusive relationships, for those who live with addiction and pain, may they be anointed with a spirit of healing and of light. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary We don't know what the night was like in the, that night in the upper room. It could have been much like this night. But we can guess what the atmosphere was in the room. Confusion, doubt, betrayal, fear, resolve. They all hang heavy in the air as Jesus gathers at table with his disciples. I don't know what emotions you bring with you 
tonight. What you're feeling as we sit in this place. We call this a sanctuary. A place of refuge and peace. But the world still cries out. There is still war, famine, disease, poverty, inequality, racism, sexism, terrorism. In some ways, the world today isn't all that different from the night in the upper room. Matthew tells the story this way. When it was evening, he took his place with the twelve. While they were eating, he said, Truly I tell you, one of you will betray me. They became greatly distressed and began to say to him one after another, Surely not I, Lord. He answered, The one who has dipped his hand into the bowl with me will betray me. The Son of Man goes as it is written of him. But woe to that one by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for that one not to have been born. Judas, who betrayed him, said, Surely not I, Rabbi. Jesus replied, You have said so. While they were eating, Jesus took a loaf of bread. After blessing it, he broke it, gave it to the disciples, said, Take and eat. This is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup. He said, drink from it all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Truly I tell you, I will never drink of it again until that day when I drink it new with you in, our, in my Father's kingdom. When we come to the table, we often bring the baggage of the world, of our lives. As people of faith, we aren't immune from hostility, addiction, abuse, anger, grief, pain. Marriages fail. Kids make bad choices. Friends betray us. Loved ones die. That baggage is too heavy for us to carry on our own. And so we are invited to come to the table just as we are. To lay that stuff at the feet of Jesus. The one who sets the table for us who welcomes us with open arms, who enfolds us with a love that never lets us go. No matter how far the prodigal ran from home, the father was waiting to welcome him. No matter how dark the valley was that the sheep strayed into, the shepherd pursued her to bring her home. Church, there is nowhere we can go where God is not present. Nothing we can do that God will not love us. The proof is the cross. That symbol of our faith where Jesus died to take away the baggage we carry. The sin that clings so close. So let's come to the table. Let's give up the regret, the shame, the pain, the grief, the agony. Let's give it up. If we believe the cross happened, why do we hold on to that stuff? cross says, let it go. Jesus says, let it go. You have been redeemed. You have been forgiven. God says, you are mine and you are loved. So 
church, let's come to the table. Let's eat and drink and be glad. And then let's invite others to join us because the table is open to them too. Let us pray. God, in this holy week, we proclaim the mystery of our faith as we witness the love of our Savior Jesus Christ as we contemplate his call for us to love one another. As Jesus faced death with humility, compassion, and grace, help us to watch with him in his passion. Set us free from self-righteousness so that by your grace we may enter into the fellowship of his suffering, trusting in your grace alone. Holy God, creator of this world and all that comes after it, we give you thanks for your mighty acts of mercy and love. You brought creation out of chaos, light out of darkness. You formed us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. You freed us from our slavery to sin, and in Jesus you have made your covenant with us to be our God. You have spoken through your prophets and made us your people, your church. Even when our love failed, you remained steadfast, loving us, redeeming us, offering us life through Jesus Christ. Lord, renew your spirit within us and unite us with all who share this meal. Bless this bread and this cup. May they be for us a communion in the body and blood of our Lord. Through this meal, grant us communion with all your beloved and solidarity with all who suffer and know violence or injustice. Pour out your spirit upon us. Grant us the peace of Christ so that we may enter into the brokenness of the world, bearing the light of your resurrection and living as symbols of your beloved community kingdom you call us to build here and now. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Among friends gathered around a common table, Jesus took a loaf of bread. After giving thanks, he blessed it. He broke it. He gave it to his friends, his followers, saying, take and eat. This is my body broken for you. Do this and remember me. Following the meal, Jesus took a cup of wine. He said, this cup is the new covenant sealed in my blood. My blood poured out for you and for the forgiveness of sins. Drink from it, all of you, and remember me. He whom the universe could not contain is present with us as we eat of this bread. The one who claims us and calls us by name meets us as we drink from the cup. So I invite you to take the bread of heaven and the cup of blessing. Taste and see that the Lord is good.
Let us pray. Loving God, as we leave your table, we thank you for the mystery of faith, for your steadfast love. Grant that we may be drawn to Christ, the light of our life. May we receive the light of your presence and be transformed by it so that we may go out and transform the world. Amen. The supper is finished. The candles have burned low. While the road we travel will lead us home into the light of a new day, the road Jesus walks leads to darkness and a cross. We will walk that road too, but only from a distance. And so we part, depart tonight not with a special blessing. Our blessing is here at the table. But with these words from the Gospel of Mark. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. and joy for woman and man a place at the table revising the roles deciding the share with wisdom and grace dividing the power for woman and man, a system that's fair. And God will delight when we are creators of justice and joy, compassion and peace. Yes, God will delight when we are creators of justice justice and joy for young and for old a place at the table a voice you be heard a part in the song the hands of a child in hands that And God will delight when we are creators of justice and joy, compassion and peace. Yes, God will delight when we are creators of justice, justice and joy. For just and unjust, a place at the table, 
Abuser abused with need to forgive In anger in hurt a mindset of mercy For just and unjust a new way to live And God will delight when we are creators of justice and joy, compassion, and peace. Yes, God will delight when we are creators of justice. Justice and joy. For everyone born a place at the table to live without fear and simply to be, to work to speak out, to witness and worship. For everyone born the right to be free. And God will delight when we are creators of justice and joy, compassion and peace. Yes, God will delight when we are creators of justice, justice and joy.